Members, the sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development. And I must inform the House that questions 2, 3 and 4 have been withdrawn. I call Mr George Robinson. Thank you, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, question 1. The initial configuration and design of the proposed access to the new Dard HQ was submitted in April 2015 as part of the plan and application. In response to concerns from local residents, the configuration and the position of the road has been amended and resubmitted. The detailed design drawings for the new configuration are currently being developed for submission to Transport NI by the end of November, so the end of this month. This new access road will cross um, private land and DFP's land and property services have been commissioned to negotiate with the landowner on behalf of my department. Our plan is to appoint a contractor at the end of January 2016 and we expect the negotiation for the required access to be completed in advance of that. Consultations with the Environment Agency as part of the planning process have ensured that the new access has been designed sensitively, taking into account the listed structures that are close to the site, such as the church, the graveyard, and in order to maintain the character of the area. Mr. Robinson, for a supplement. Thank, thank the Minister for her response. Uh, can the Minister give the House an update on the reloc relocation process and the re rebuild situation of the uh, Dart headquarters? Plans are, are on, on way, and um, I'm very pleased with the progress. Obviously, we're very keen to um, deliver on the timescale, which we've already set out. And staff, um, we're working very closely with staff just to be able to plan that transition. Obviously, the member will know that we're doing that in a, in a transitionary phase to allow people time to adjust and, and to make, um, I suppose, a, a very comprehensive transition to the new site. So everything is going according to schedule. Um, I'm very um, pleased with the work that, that's ongoing, and it's full steam ahead. Um, we've other Locations have been delivered on, delivered on a, part, a part of the wider relocation programme where we have um, the fisheries office opened in South Down, where we have the work started at the um, Rivers Agency headquarters in um, Cookstown at the Lockery site, and I intend to officially open um, the Forest Service headquarters in Fermanagh over the next number of weeks. So it's um, certainly um, all very positive work and ongoing, and, and we're hopeful to deliver on the timescale, which I've already set out. Well, Mr John Dalley. Speaker, I thank the, the Minister for her answer. And I'm sure the Minister would agree with me that while a second entrance to the former army camp is of critical importance, far more important is what is going to happen on the remainder of this 900-acre site, and if, in fact, the infrastructure is there to attract inward investment and, in the words of locals, attract perhaps hundreds and not thousands of new jobs. That's really what East Derry wants. Speaker, can the Minister uh, provide an update on what action? My apologies. Sorry, my apologies. Sorry Minister. My apologies. Um, yes, I, mean, I can concur with everything that has been said in relation to the potential of the site and the wider benefits for Ballycally and the entire North West area in terms of um, the, the, I suppose, the attraction to that site. I think that there, the fact that Dard has moved on to the site, we've um, become the anchor tenant, I think it creates and opens up the possibility and the potential from other investors to want to move on to that site. And obviously, um, there has been significant interest shown um, to OFM DFM, who um, obviously own the rest of the site. So there are tremendous benefits to be had for the entire North West, particularly in terms of employment opportunities, construction opportunities, and all, and all the other things that go along with developing the entire site. Ms. Overend. Thank you. Thought um, the speaker was going to give the minister a new challenge of grouping the supplementaries together there. Um, but could I ask the minister if maybe she could provide an update on, on what action her department has taken so far to, contaminate, to decontaminate the land at Ballykelly and especially to remove the lead? And overall, how much does she believe the site will cost to clean up as well as removing the likelihood of flooding? Well, all those things were factored into the original costs which were set out and were all part of the original plan. Um, obviously, we had looked at the existing buildings that were on site, which were relatively new buildings compared to the other buildings, which perhaps have um, contamination issues. But that is certainly an issue which OFM DFM are taking forward through um, central services through DFP. Um, that, that's their work. We're interested in one specific part of the site, and I'm confident that we have taken all the actions we need to do to address any potential contamination issues. And that's all been built into the programme um, timescale. 
the, the member referred to flooding on the site, um, and we're very aware of the, the flooding that happened on the happens on the bottom end of the site and the significant cost that is associated with actually making sure we, we take that water off so it stops flooding the site. So um, there are all considerations, I believe, for any future investment of anybody coming onto that site, but certainly from, from my part, for my department's part and for the future of the headquarters going there, we're, we're content that we have um, programmed and taken account of all those potential challenges that there may have been. Call Mr. Kakaloshi and remind the member that is constituency focused. Uh, the Minister has outlined the obvious benefits of the relocation of the DART headquarters. As the anchor tent is on the Ballykelly and Shackleton site, I wonder could you outline what other benefits she thinks uh, may accrue uh, to the Ballykelly and indeed to the wider, wider east area and north west area? Um, again, I thank the member for his contributions and absolutely agree about the, the wider benefits. The, as I've always said, the relocation of the headquarters is obviously going to help stimulate the local economy through, um, I suppose, a number, of, a number of ways, particularly in relation to increased spending power in the local area, the provision of high-quality, um, high-value public sector jobs actually moving on to the site, and obviously in advance of all of that is all the ongoing construction works with the, the clearing of the site, and we'll need ongoing servicing of the building. So I think that the benefits speak for themselves in terms of the benefits to the North West as a whole, and I think, for me, very much at the core of the, the entire relocation project and all the, the relocations that we have um, been successful in, in um, delivering to date has always been about sharing the wealth right across the economy and making sure that we have a fair distribution of public sector jobs. And I think that that is um, only right and proper, and I am glad that my department is leading the way in terms of delivering for that. Mr Beggs is not in his place. I call Mr Hildage. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number six. My department administers the horse racing fund to support the two local um, race courses and in 2015 charges and bookmakers have brought in just under 369,000 to the fund. Following rep representations from the local race courses and from bookmakers, I commissioned my officials to review the horse racing fund charges and a public consultation was launched on the 2nd of July 2015. We have now received um, consultation responses and officials are currently considering the responses and I will make a decision on the way forward in due course. Mr. Hildage for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and, and thank the information supplied by the Minister. The, the work of those who manage the facilities at Down Royal and Down Patrick is to be acknowledged and, and congratulated. Uh, does the Minister value uh, this as part of the rural economy, and can, can she help progress and support, support these venues as a matter of urgency? Yes, I um, absolutely value um, what they do, and I think that um, in terms of employment that is created and all the other um, benefits, I, I think that what we're trying to do with this consultation is to make sure that um, the horse racing levy is sufficient that allows us to be able to continue to invest and obviously um, attract additional um, support into, into the um, horse racing industry. So the, the reason behind the, con the um, consultation itself is to try and see where we can improve things if we can improve things. Um, I was pleased to, to see the number of people actually that responded to the consultation. I think that shows a significant industry or industry interest, I suppose, in, in the subject. So um, I look forward to being able to uh, make a decision on the way forward as soon as possible, given that the consultation is just closed. Mr Joe Byrne. Mr Speaker, can the Minister state if she is considering giving any grant aid to these race courses, because they do provide a very important service to Northern Ireland, particularly to the horse breeders? No, I'm not currently giving consideration to that. What I'm currently looking at is where I can help the industry. Um, this consultation response in itself, if we, if we do, and I am minded to look, if I am minded to look towards um, raising the levy, then there will be obviously a, an advantage for the race courses in that they would have additional funding to be able to reinvest. So um, that's the priority area for me at this moment in time. I have spoke with Horse Board Ireland and horse, in, horse industry and representatives in relation to support for the industry, and I certainly am willing to do all I can to support the industry in going forward. Well, Mr Phil Flanagan. Let's control your cash every shot. Question number seven. Recently, I launched three new forestry grant schemes and allocated up to 17.4 million to support private woodland expansion and the sustainable management of existing woodland under the Rural Development Programme for 2014-20. The schemes are the Forest Expansion Scheme, the Forest Protection Scheme and the Woodland Investment Grant. This funding is sufficient to create 1,800 hectares of new woodland and to sustain approximately 4,000 hectares of woodland created under previous programmes. I will make a small, it will make a small and but positive contribution towards my aim of achieving 12% woodland cover by the middle of this century. 
Our woodlands are vital community resource and there is a clear consensus about the need to increase woodland area to counter the impact of climate change, to provide a habitat for wildlife and places for people to relax and unwind from stress and to take part in physical exercise. The forestry grant scheme which I have just launched will help deliver these needs. I would urge farmers and landowners not to miss out on this funding opportunity which can help diversify their farming activity and to remember that applications for planting this winter under the Forestry Expansion Scheme, scheme must be submitted to Forest Service by 3 p.m. on Monday, the 4th of January. Flanagan, first supplement. I thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, can she give us any indication whether uh, these grants will be available to particularly the hill farmers, given the role that trees and woodland in high, high areas can play in soaking up uh, water and rainfall and stopping it going down into valleys and causing knock on flooding in other areas? In terms of eligibility, for the, um, particularly for basic payment scheme for those um, with forestry grants, <coughs> current EU rules allow land that is eligible for the basic payment scheme and which is planted with trees under the forest expansion scheme that they can remain eligible for the basic payment scheme during the 20-year period of commitment. That is potentially a significant benefit for farmers who are thinking about diversification into forestry, and that is farmers right across the board, whether you be in a, a hill farmer or, or not. I think that um, the scheme is there, is there for all to avail of and, and potentially quite significant um, investment for both the environment but also for the individual to actually maybe look towards diversification if that's what they identify as what their future um, direction of travel might, might want to be. Well, Mr. Leslie Creek. Mr. Speaker, um, Minister, as you know, in 2011, 2007 2011 programme for government, there was an ambitious plan. Uh, which was achievable, but in fact your predecessor never came near it. In the current year, there is no target at all. Do you believe there should be a programme for afforestation in the next programme for government, and if so, some indication of the size of it? Well, no, I do not have that at this moment in time. Obviously, we have a forestry programme, a very strong forestry programme, which aims to increase um, meet the long-term aim of 12 per cent woodland cover by 2020, and we're, or by 2050, sorry. And we're working our way through that. We'll also have a review of that midway through to see if we are, in fact, living up to being able to deliver on those targets. Um, in terms of the programme for government, um, we will obviously consult on that, and I'm open to all ideas in terms of what should be our key um, asks in terms of the new programme for government. And I look forward to your support for in delivering some of those. Well, Mr. Sean. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for your answers thus far. Minister, is there any particular grants there for the encouragement of? Uh, Willow production, I'm thinking particularly of um, wood pellets as, as an alternative heat source. There's not, a, there's not a forestry grant scheme for that type of production, but however, that's potentially something that could be looked at under the Rural Business Investment Scheme, so something under the new Rural Development Programme and the LAG funding. And I encourage um, anybody who potentially would have an idea in that to, to consult with their local LAG around um, the, the opportunities for their. For, for, for that area of work. We hope to have that scheme opened up um, at the start of next year as soon as we sign off on the new rural strategies with the lags, which I hope to do by the end of December. So I think there is scope for some potential for that type of business under the new rural development programme. Mr Jim Alice. The variability of farm incomes is a problem all over the world. The complex factors affecting farm incomes are many and are varied. Bumper harvests reduce prices, um, while poor weather reduces um, yields and it can result in higher prices. Economic recession, wars, political unrest all can curb demand for food, particularly more expensive food items. Exchange rate movements can affect competitiveness of food exports uh, over a short period of time. In other industries, manufacturers can more precisely match supply with demand, and hence income variability is much less of a problem. Agriculture is a special case, and that is why the EU supports farming to the extent that it does. How successful is EU support for farmers? Well, currently, as we all know, the agriculture sector is struggling, and I want the EU to do more to help. However, taking a longer-term view of the EU, um, it has been good for the farming community in the north. In the last 15 years, the underlying trend in rail incomes is upwards. Of course, there is variation around that trend, with 2014 being an example, an example of negative variation. As I have already outlined, volatility in farm incomes is inescapable because it is due to factors beyond our control. In 2014, our farmers received around £295 million under the CAP. Farmers in the north would have been much worse off without this EU funding, which of course would disappear in a Brexit situation. Outside the EU, funding for agriculture would fall unless the Treasury provided additional funds. And we all know that the British Government has long wanted to reduce the funding going to farmers, and this would be the detriment of all of our farmers. Mr. Alistair, first supplement. 
Leaving aside the propaganda, isn't the fact that current falling incomes are a devastating testimony to the abject failure of the EU to live up to its own promise in its own treaty, the Lisbon Treaty, to increase the income of those depending on agriculture. They have been meant to be failed, and their recent attitude to the milk crisis showed that they have could not care less. Is that not so? As I said in my original answer, I think there's room for reform. I said that um, I don't agree with the position that Europe have taken in relation to the response to the dairy crisis. I've made the statement to this House on a number of occasions in the past. I've made that very clear. I'm continuing to lobby the Commission around what more they can do in relation to intervention prices. I think the approach that they took was not the correct approach. But the fact also does remain that the CIP ensures that £300 million, pounds, almost £300 million pounds per year, goes into the pockets of farmers. And if we were to find ourselves in a scenario where we were no longer part of the CIP, then where is that money going to come from? Who is going to assist farmers to be able to continue to produce food? Agriculture is different. Agriculture is different. Well, I tell you what, I wouldn't be wanting to be dependent on the Tories to be able to replace the CAP. I would not want to be dependent on this, the Tories to replace almost £300 million pounds a year in subsidy to farmers because they're opposed to subsidy. That is not their ideology. So I would like you to um, you can uh, have your own opinion in relation to Brexit, but I strongly will not share your view. I believe that the CAP, whilst it uh, creates plenty, plenty of challenges, plenty of red tape, plenty of regulations, all things we have to work our way through, but the benefit to farmers is almost £300 million pound per year, almost £500 million pound for the Rural Development Programme that was money invested in rural communities, rural business, all things that make a difference to the lives of rural dwellers and farmers. So um, I, I believe whilst um, there are plenty of challenges, as I said, with the EU, I think that the benefits for the farmers speak for themselves. Mr Edwin Poots. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. How is the Minister and her department helping to increase the uh, individual's earnings? Um, uh, who are involved in agriculture through reducing red tape um, on her side and also in providing um, practical support to farmers uh, in a time of food price crises? Well, in terms of red tape, obviously the, the member knows that we're continually trying to look at where we can improve things, how, and I think that we will have another opportunity to improve things further with the change in the makeup of the departments, where we have an opportunity, I think, particularly to look at our inspection regime. Um, I think that um, there are quite a num number of other examples we can point to where things have been improved. But in relation to practical support, my advisors are on the ground. The CAFRI advisors are working with farmers, particularly in relation to benchmarking. We are currently just recruiting for business development groups, which would be, again, advisors working with farmers on how best they can suit the, the, meet the needs of their business into the future. So there's plenty of practical work going on within CAFRI across our, our three campuses in terms of the education opportunity. I think that it's great to see that um, so many farmers are availing and wanting to learn more. They want to benchmark. They're wanting to look at knowledge transfer. They want to look at how they can improve efficiency. The, the new rural development programme is going to be uh, an absolute vital tool, I believe, in terms of supporting the industry into the future. So I think that as we work our way through the development of the Farm Business Improvement Scheme, there are certainly going to be benefits around looking at production efficiencies for all farmers across all sectors, and it's something that I have worked very hard to secure that we have the largest ever rural development programme in the north of Ireland that it's ever seen. And I think that um, the sooner we can get these programmes opened up at the start of the year, the better for the industry as in its entirety. Well, Mr. Kieran, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, the Minister will be aware of the recent uh, case where a local farmer, a local uh, vegetable grower, received eight pence for a turnip at the same time the same turnips were being sold in the supermarket for 80 pence. Well, does the Minister agree that that is a shocking state of affairs? And what is the Minister doing uh, to the, uh, uh, ensure that uh, the suppliers uh, get a fair and reasonable uh, return for their produce? I totally agree with the member. It is. It's disgrace. It's shocking. And I think that um, you know, the member will know that from I have taken up office, I've been very committed to bringing forward a strategy for the industry as a whole going forward, which is the going for growth strategy. And central to that strategy and going forward is recognition that there is one supply chain 
And in order to have one supply chain, we need respect right along that supply chain. So farmers need to be paid a fair price for what they produce. Obviously, in, in the example that you highlight, I think that uh, nobody could um, ever be um, accused of being startling or, st or using something. Somebody getting that kind of price for what they're producing is absolutely disgusting and not, not, not shouldn't be acceptable. I recently convened a supply chain forum, which is an attempt to bring um, primary producers, processors and retailers all together to look at how we can move forward together, how we can create more respect uh, within the supply chain and how we can communicate that better. So we're doing, involved in that piece of work alongside, I'm always happy and always will do, challenge the major retailers around what they're paying for, what they're buying from our local farmers. Well, Mr. Robbins. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. Minister, going back to the, the thrust of the main story, the EU Milk Board has actually just called for Commissioner Hogan to stand down because of his failure to redress the ongoing crisis and the milk crisis. I know the, the Minister and her party have been critical of Commissioner Hogan in the past. Would she join in that call for him to resign? I think what um, I have said consistently, I do not agree with the approach that Europe has taken. I do not agree with the approach that the Commissioner has taken. I have been critical of him. I have been critical to him in person. I have been critical to him when I have written to him. I continually will challenge him in terms of the role that he is playing in terms of trying to support the industry. But yes, I think there will come a time that if the dairy industry continues with the low price and the glut that we're in, there will come a time where his position of burying his head in the sand and saying there's no crisis, well, it's no longer sustainable. So I will continue to challenge the, the Commissioner while he's in position around what he's doing to deliver for the dairy sector. I haven't been shy about it in the past and I'm certainly not going to be shy about it in the future. Mr William Irwin. Uh, Minister, given that £4 billion per year of exports were going into Russia and that ban uh, left uh, farmers in a dilemma. Do you, not believe, do you believe that Europe could have done much more to help the situation, given that this was totally outside farmers' control? Yes, because whenever we point to particularly the, the situation within the dairy industry, where we know that one of the contributory factors is the fact that Russia stopped buying, whilst we weren't sending dairy products into that market, we were sending cheeses, so that, that created a problem for the industry and it's helped um, so with the sustained low price. So yes, I do believe Europe could have done more. That's the point that I'm making. I continue to challenge them and will continue to challenge Commissioner Hogan around what he is doing because I believe the approach that they took, and I, whilst I welcome that there's a, a, some funding, some money going out into farmers' bank accounts as we actually speak, from, it's been paid out from last week, so they'll receive it over um, last week and this week. Whilst I accept that that's in, in a sense, as a one-off, slightly helpful. I don't think it's the longer-term approach that we need. I do believe still that we need to see a review of intervention prices that would allow the market to correct itself. Mr. Barry McElduff. Uh, question number nine, Kesht Iverini. Given the importance of this issue, I have asked my department to begin assessing the impact of a possible um, British exit from the EU on agriculture and rural life in the north. Clearly, an exit from the EU would mean direct payments for farmers and rural development funding to the EU would stop, or from the EU would stop. However, <clears throat> the many uncertainties surrounding the, a potential exit makes a quantitative assessment of impacts very difficult. There are significant uncertainties around the type of trade arrangements with the EU and the rest of the world that could be negotiated following a withdrawal from the EU membership. Of particular significance is there would be a tariff-free, if whether there would be a tariff-free access to EU markets for agriculture products and vice versa. If direct payments from the EU stopped, it would not be feasible for the executive to fund these payments at current levels from the block grant unless additional money was forthcoming from the British Treasury. It has been clear that the British Government has long wanted to reduce the level of support going to farmers and to rural development under the CAP. They did not regard this type of support as value for money. I believe that the Treasury would be unsympathetic to calls for, money of the, for, to calls for some of the money saved from withdrawing as a member of the EU to be used to maintain direct support to farmers and to rural communities at current levels. The, a significant reduction in direct support would leave many of our farmers in real long-term financial difficulty. A uh, faster rate of structural change in the industry would be inevitable. Small farms would likely be the, be the most likely to suffer, and a reduction of funding for farmers and rural communities would very likely have knock-on effects for the wider environment. Uh, can I ask the Minister if she agrees with me that when left to their own devices, the British Government at this time poorly represents, fails to represent our farmers and our fishermen? Yeah, I think that... Um, one of the things that we have been able to be successful in is that we were able to, particularly in relation to the dairy crisis, it took a long time to get DEFRA onto um, our page in, in relation to the needs of the local industry. We worked very hard to be able to secure that. 
We made sure that we were a very strong voice in Europe in relation to raising the significant and unique circumstances of our local dairy industry. So I believe that um, that's why it's so important that we have locally elected ministers taking decisions that can understand the local um, situation, for, whether that be in farming or manufacturing or any other sector out there. It's so important that we have locally elected ministers that can take decisions in the best interest. I certainly um, always take my case directly to Europe because I think that that's important that we do that. Um, do they always listen? Absolutely not. But certainly that doesn't make us stop um, going out and making as much noise as we possibly can in relation to fighting the corner for our local industry. Mr. Ian McRae. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Give, given that the um, Minister has already stated that she believes that we're better off in Europe than, than out, but given the fact that the, approximately £8.2 billion is paid into Europe by the, the British Government, what is she doing to try and um, ensure that the farming and agriculture industry here in Northern Ireland, if the British government and the well, if the people were to pull out of Europe, that we get the maximum benefit for our farmers out of that 8.2 billion that, that is paid in? I think you're jumping a lot of, uh, lot of skips, but I think that um, if I think we have to look at realities. The reality is that the Tories aren't interested. It's not their. It will not, never be their policy that they'll want to subsidise farmers. It'll never be their policy that they'll want to replace like for like. So I would never be confident, I don't think anybody could stand out and be very confident that the Tories will replace, if, the, if there was a Brexit and pulled out of the EU, I think that it's highly unlikely, given Tory ideology, that they will ever replace £300 million for farmers, up to £500 million in the previous programme for the rural development um, work that goes on, going, so that's business investment, that's working with communities in relation to community services, basic services. So no, I would not be confident that the Tories will want to replace that, and however long they remain in power, none of us can be sure of that. So I think that we're best placed that we look towards um, fighting the challenges, look for reform, absolutely, but I think that um, our interests of our farmers are better served within the EU. Mr Oliver McMahon. Thank you. Ever a Question 10. The Business Development Group's um, programme was launched in early November and applications will be accepted up to 4pm on Monday the 14th of December. The CAFRI has led the, the has the lead role in developing, delivering and promoting the scheme which is funded under the Rural Development Programme. To encourage uptake of the programme and maximise enrolments, CAFRI engaged with industry stakeholders prior to the launch and continues to do so during the application period. CAFRI is using a variety of media to promote the programme to all sectors of the industry, including press releases, information leaflets, radio interviews and the DARD and CAFRI websites. Information has been provided about the benefits of taking part, eligibility to apply, the funding available and the application process. It is anticipated that CAFRI will allocate up to 1,500 farmers into groups in the 15-16 year. A further 1,500 will be allocated to the business development groups and subsequent tranches to ensure that the programme positively impacts across all sectors of the industry. Sectoral limits will be applied to applications. In the event of oversubscription to one or more sectors, then we will have to apply some criteria. The aim is to ensure that business development groups provide support for progressive farm businesses across all sectors of the industry in proportions which are representative of the size and sectoral constitution of the industry as a whole. Can I thank the Minister for her answer. But can, can the Minister tell us what funding is available for farmers who are keen to participate in these groups? In addition to um, the benefits of the groups, the benefits to the farmers themselves, working together with their peers, the business development groups will bring many benefits to farmers, which is going to help them to develop their businesses, to learn about new technology, improve farm profitability, and they'll be supported by a CAFRI development advisor, and they'll have the option to gain a level three um, uh, qualification. And the, where farmers attend all eight training events, they're going to qualify for a payment of up to £480 per year. This payment is planned for the first two years of the programme and then it will be reviewed. An allowance of up to 600 per training event hosted will also be payable and this will be payable for farmers throughout the lifetime of the scheme. So there's, a, there's an opportunity for them to take part in the ongoing training and, and, de and development work by, by also assisting them financially to be able to um, perhaps have someone help on farm whilst they're off um, at, the, at the courses. And also it actually encourages them to actually hold training events and share their best practice and what, what good work they do with other farmers. Mr. Stewart, take some. Um, Mr. Speaker. My department plans to assist dairy farmers to move towards lower cost production methods through the ongoing delivery of education and training programmes at the College of Agriculture, Food and Rural Enterprise. 
CAFRI will also continue to demonstrate knowledge and technology transfer projects which aim to improve business efficiency for dairy farm businesses. From April 2015 to 16 November 2015, CAFRI has delivered 57 training events aimed at improving production performance to 1,166 dairy farmers, and CAFRI is currently demonstrating five technology projects to the dairy industry. My department will continue to work with AFBI to ensure that knowledge and technology transfer projects reflect the outcomes of research into low-cost dairy production systems. Currently, my CAFRI advisors are assisting farmers by offering workshops entitled Feed and Finance to look at the cost of milk production. In addition, my staff are assisting farmers to complete business plans and cash flows. Participating in CAFRI's business development groups will also provide dairy farmers the opportunity to work collaboratively to improve technical efficiency, improve business management skills and to learn about new technologies and innovative ways of working. I would encourage all farmers, including dairy farmers, to apply to the business development groups which before the closing date of the 14th of December. It ends the period for listed questions. We now move to topical questions. I call Mr Stephen Moutry. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister to outline what her department is doing to support local pig farmers? I actually um, just met with pig producers yesterday in relation to um, some of the challenges and some of the challenges which the member will be aware of are in relation to the, the price differential that they, they receive, which is a, an ongoing challenge for, for local farmers. The other area where, which we discussed and um, which is ongoing is obviously opening up new markets, so new potential um, export opportunities for um, pig product. Um, we're particularly focused on China, but there are obviously other opportunities which we're also um, looking towards. Mr. Moutry, for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, and I thank the Minister for her answer thus far. Given the recent figures published by the National Pig Association that indicate that only typically 30 per cent of the gammons consumed in the United Kingdom at Christmas are of British origin, do you feel that your department could be doing more to help exploit this area? Certainly, my department is doing all that we can to open up new export opportunities. And as I said, China is a key market. But however, we're also looking towards um, Australia, America, um, Philippines. There's quite a number of other um, areas that we're targeting. And that's in conjunction with the industry. We're also looking towards, and I've just recently worked with the Deputy Minister to establish a new marketing body, which will obviously create opportunities again for um, all sectors, not just the pig sector, but certainly trying to get us to be able to market our product and to get into more opportunities, whether that be across England, Scotland, Wales, or Europe, or, or even further afield. So I think that um, all the work that we're doing with the Agri-Food Strategy Board will lead to benefits in the, in the longer, medium to longer term for all sectors, including the pig sector. Well, Mr. Tom Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister give the House an update on her strategy to tackling the TB issue? Yes, the member will know that, um, particularly in relation to um, TB, that we established an uh, industry partnership, which was to take forward a, a body of work, and they have recently um, published their um, interim report and um, will produce a, a further report at the early part of next year, which will look towards, I believe, a sea change on, on attitudes right across industry uh, and, and farmers on how we can tackle TB. We have our TB eradication plan, which is worth £4 million um, from the EU. That's ongoing, and I think that um, we're all working very hard from every possible angle we can to be able to drive down the levels of TB, which will then enable us to be able to look towards more export opportunities if we get to the stage where we can eradicate the disease. Mr Buchanan, first supplementary. Yeah, I thank the Minister for her answer, but I do think it's not much comfort for the farming community, especially those that are closed with TB for many months uh, and are suffering great financial constraints, that we're still uh, wrestling with this issue and nothing positive has come to the fore. For to deal with the matter. And would the Minister agree that this is a serious failing under her watch and that of her predecessor that to date, after many years, little has been done to tackling this, uh, this particular issue? I know this is a favourite question of the Member for Question Time, and I, I, my answer remains the same in that TB is a complicated disease. There's no simple solution or no quick fix. If there was, we would just use best practice in any other country and take it and apply it here. Unfortunately, that's not the case. There isn't any good practice. There isn't any good example to look for. Look, um, for. We have our TVR, our Test, Vaccinate and Release programme. We have our TB eradication programme approved by the EU, which is a, a programme of £4 million. We have the TV, um, TVR strategic, par TV strategic Partnership Group, which is ongoing and has produced quite a number of recommendations. So I don't think we could come at it from any more angles than that. It's a very complicated disease. We want to be able to eradicate it. We've been very successful in relation to BR brucellosis, and hopefully we'll get there as well with TB. Mr. John McAllister. 
Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I'm sure the Minister is aware of a, an initiative between Macron of Firm and Young Farmers Clubs of Ulster called Land Mobility. I just wondered, was that an initiative that she would support trying to match far, retiring farmers with young people trying to get into the industry? Is that something that she would support and lend uh, the support of her and her department behind? Um. I actually, I've worked in the past with young farmers and Macron Firm around um, the Know Your Neighbour campaign and I'm very open to looking towards um, any of the campaigns that they, they bring forward. I think it, it's certainly in my experience in looking at where, areas where they've worked in partnerships have been very successful. So um, I'm very open to, to looking at um, supporting them again if, if they came forward with um, a proposal. But um, to, to date they haven't actually come forward up, um, with anything specific apart from obviously we have an ongoing programme of work with young farmers which um, I, I'm very pleased with and, and I regularly enjoy um, I suppose speaking to them and talking about the programmes that they have been involved with. Mr McAllister, first supplement. And thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I'm grateful to the Minister for her reply. She will also know that some of the big blockages we have um, in succession planning in on, on farms is also the Conacre system and that causes problems with land mobility and succession planning as well. How does she see uh, her department addressing that issue and how would she drive forward any change in culture or any change in the way we do our, our, that system? Again, the member will, will um, hope to be aware that we have a succession plan and programme within the Rural Development Programme, so obviously it goes out and works with farm families around you know, planning for the future and how, how their farm business will look in the future and who and when um, any changes will happen. So certainly as part of the new rural development programme, farm family planning is going to be another key part of that. So obviously, whether it be the Conacher situation or, or any of the other factors that contributes to, um, I suppose, when or how or, or, or why um, changes would happen on, on family farms, we're certainly going to be playing our role in relation to that. Also alongside that, obviously, we have um, recently announced the Young Farmers Payment that's going to be 81 just over 81 um, euros per hectare, so that in itself is a good incentive for a young person um, to, be, um, to be head of Houghton and to take over the family farm. And I think that the fact that all those young people have taken part in a level two in agriculture and are looking towards further um, education opportunities, and I think that, that that's all um, bodes very well for the future of farming. Mrs. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister whether she would acknowledge the concerns and perceptions of many in rural and farming communities that funding from the last Rural Development Programme was heavily slanted towards sporting organisations, including large amounts to already cash-rich groups. Given the farming crisis, will she give this House an assurance that farmers will be prioritised in the 2014-2020 funding? Yeah. Well, no, I don't agree with you. Um, I certainly think that the previous Rural Development Programme, which is coming to an end and we're about to open up our new programme, has been extremely successful in rural communities. I think it's been extremely successful in funding projects. And I always say the beauty of the Rural Development Programme is it's not somebody sitting in a department telling you what you need. It's actually homegrown ideas. It comes from the community. It's grassroots up. So I hope for one minute the member's not suggesting that some of the projects which I know she visits and thinks that are very valuable projects are, certain, are not valuable projects um, after all. Because I think that when you go out on the ground and you take a look at how the Rural Development Programme has assisted communities to deliver for themselves, working in partnership quite often with, with other um, funders, this certainly in my opinion, opinion has been money well spent. In relation to the farming crisis, um, I have continued to do everything that I absolutely can, particularly in relation to the dairy crisis. I am happy to um, champion the local industry's needs, and I have done so over the last um, number of months, last year, year and a half, particularly in relation to the dairy sector. But what um, I have delivered for the rural community and for farmers is the largest ever rural development programme that the North has ever seen. So that is my commitment to agriculture and to rural, making sure that we have the vehicle to be able to deliver for rural communities to deliver for farmers and I'm certainly keen to open up all the schemes as quickly as I possibly can, some which have already have opened and the rest will open up in the new year. So certainly I think that um, I don't think it's helpful and I think it's disingenuous to actually play farming against rural communities because they're all part of the same. Dobson for a supplementary. 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal, Deputy Speaker. I'm disappointed by the Minister's response. As important as sport is, we have heard loud and clear in this building the real need which exists amongst our farming families. Will the Minister agree to meet with farmers and rural representatives to ensure the focus within the programme reflects the real need of our farming community? And is she confident that the makeup of the local action groups will enable them to address that need? Yes, I'm very comfortable with the makeup of the local action groups. I'm also very comfortable with all the applications that have been processed and received funding. I think that um, when you refer to sporting organisations and cash-rich sporting organisations, I'd remind you that your councillors sit on the lags also. Your party <coughs> colleagues sit on the lags also that distribute the funding. So applications are received from community groups from no matter what um, organisation it comes from. And those lags, which include um, local community representatives, they include councillors from all different political parties, they make a decision based on the criteria that's set out, and I hope that the member is not referring to anything being untoward in terms of the delivery within lags, because that's certainly not the case. All applications are assessed based on the criteria, and again, continuing to, to um, play a farming off against rural communities it really isn't helpful, because you know farmers live in rural communities. Farmers are entitled to basic services. Farmers have the same challenges in relation to access to transport. Farmers have the same challenges in relation to broadband. Farmers have the same challenges in relation to access and education for their families. So. I don't think that we need to play one against the other. They're both farmers are rural people. They live in rural communities, and rural communities and rural people are entitled to the same support and the same attention from my department. And I'm sorry, not apologetic for that. Mr. Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, I've asked you a number of times in regards to applicants for the young farmers and the regional reserve that have been cut, re refused because of the qualification of their accountant. Can the minister inform me? Has she actually? confirmed that communication with our department officials? Yes, I can. Um, we've been working our way through the issue. We're encouraging there's about 80, perhaps I think it's the figures, about 80 farmers, young farmers that were found themselves in this scenario. We're encouraging them all to respond to the department and they'll be told how to deal with the issue. Just one for a supplementary. Thank the Minister for that answer because that's what she'd given me in written questions as well. Can she then explain why a department official told a constituent of mine last week that the reason he had been turned down was because his accountant did not have the proper qualification, but he would not put it in writing because he had been told not to put it in writing, but that was the reason he was not getting it was because of the qualification of his accountant. So it still seems that the Minister's officials are applying that rule, although are not prepared to actually tell the, the constituent that that is why they are doing it. Well, instead of coming into question time, I think it would be more advisable for you to call up to my office to talk about the, any official that is not doing something that is proper practice. I have clearly said to you that I believe that there is a way to resolve the issue. If, in those cases that I have referred to, that are perhaps about 80 cases, just under it, that if, they, if their accountant did not have the proper recognised qualification, as in not part of a registered um, accountancy body, then there was a challenge to be addressed. But I believe we found a way to address it. If you have a particular case you wish to discuss, call up to my office after question time. Call Mr. Stuart Dixon. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And thank you, Minister. Minister, uh, you have responsibility for rivers, uh, as indeed do Northern Ireland Water, in certain circumstances. Do you recognise that there is a considerable confusion uh, in both the public's mind and indeed an opportunity between both NI Water and the Rivers Agency to actually dispute a great deal of rivers matters across Northern Ireland? I think there's a lot of um, cross departmental working, but um, which is ongoing in relation to quite a number of projects. And, and I do believe that sometimes there is often confusion, which is why I think it's helpful that the executive established the flood line, which meant that you have one point of contact in terms of if you're experiencing flooding. There will obviously be um, opportunities with the new departmental structure to be able to address that challenge once and for all, and that all those issues will be dealt with under one department. Sir Dixon, for a supplementary. Um, thank you, Principal Libby Speaker. Uh, Minister, I. I um welcome your recognition that there is confusion and despite the fact that there's water line uh, the confusion continues to reign for example um, the recent flooding incident at green island railway station east antrim is a classic case of both departments trying to palm one off onto the other and at this point in time today neither rivers agency nor ni water are prepared to take responsibility for what is quite simply a very dangerous situation because it forces pedestrians onto the roadway well, I'm not aware of the, the ins and outs of the detail of, of the case that you're referring to, but again, if you want to drop an email or um, talk to private office just in relation to trying to establish, I only can answer for the work of Rivers Agency, not indeed for the work for DRD or for NI Water, but I'm very happy to explore if there is any shortcomings in terms of, of my department's role. Call Mr. Nelson McCausland. 
Um, the um, Minister would be well aware of the issue of um, foot and mouth disease within uh, the agricultural sector. Is she also concerned about the recent outbreak of foot in mouth disease by her colleague Mr Flanagan, who seems to not think one moment that ISIS are terrorists and then the next minute thinks they are? Is he suffering from foot in mouth disease? The member knows that that's not an appropriate question to the Department of Agriculture. I call Ms. Bronwyn McGoughan. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much indeed. Could I ask the, uh, the Minister, she has been on her feet for three quarters of an hour, and uh, I think it was only during once the word fishing was mentioned. So, could I ask the, uh, the Minister, now that we're coming up to the December um, quotas, etc., uh, what prosper, pros prospects are there for her going to Brussels to bring us back some good news for the fishing industry? Well, obviously the member knows I can only answer the questions that are put before me, but I'm very happy to talk about fishing. I have um, recently met with the industry around preparations for the, Europe, the Council in Brussels um, over the next number of weeks, where we have an opportunity to go out and obviously argue our quota um, situation. It's going to be an uphill challenge again, but sure, we, we've been used to that for the past five or six years. Certainly, um, I've identified the priority um, asks for, for our local industry in conjunction with the industry, and I will go out with the industry and fight our corner in terms of getting the best possible result that we can. We'll use our scientists, we'll use all the evidence that we have to be able to argue for um, additional quota. Time is up. We now move.